the revised papers have that uh, on Tuesday with the original marked up graded paper and the revised paper. Uh, you don't need to staple them together. You can paper clip them together or something like that. <clears throat> we are picking up in Act 4, Scene 6. And we just left off on Tuesday with Lear and Gloucester talking about seeing. And Lear says to Gloucester, uh, line 147, yet you see how this world goes. And Gloucester says, I see it feelingly. What art mad, et cetera, et cetera, man may see how this world goes with no eyes, look with your ears. And Lear mentions, you have seen the farmer's dog bark at a beggar, Gloucester. Yep. And the creature ran from a cur. There thou mightst behold the great image of authority, a dog's obeyed in office. What's the image of authority? The dog. Or the other word he uses for it, the cur, which is kind of an untamed wild dog, a, a mongrel, as it were. Okay? And he's going to give us an example of what he means about this image of authority. Okay? Now, earlier, uh, left hand column, beginning 107, 108. You know, Gloucester says, You're the king. And Lear says, That's right, every inch a king. And he talks about authority. And then he talks about, you know, certain offenses that get certain offenses adultery, I shall not die, etc., etc. Well, now he's going to kind of go back to that theme, beginning with 160. Okay. Here's the cur obeyed in office. That is, the person who has authority in office and how they treat the people that come before him. But Lear's going to imply why they're doing what they're doing. Thou rascal beetle, hold thy bloody hand. And you've got a gloss about beetle. It's a religious office. Okay. Um, 160. Parish officer responsible for giving whippings. Okay. These aren't whippings for civil law violations. These are whippings for religious law violations, okay, which sometimes overlapped. Adultery, for example, was both a civil offense and a religious offense. Okay? Not tithing was a, was a religious offense, but it bled over in that Parliament passed laws in the Middle Ages that said you had to tithe. Okay? The whole, you know, um, church and state issue. So, Thou rascal beetle, hold thy bloody hand. Why dost thou lash that whore? Okay. Why are you beating prostitutes? Strip thine own back. Why? Thou hotly lust to use her in that kind for which thou whipst her. The reason you're beating her is because you sexually desire her. So you ought to really be beating yourself. Why? Well, in the Gospels, and I think it's in all four Gospels, Christ says what? He who looks upon a woman and lusts after her to sleep with her, it's as good as doing the deed. Which has all kinds of echoes in the sonnets, which unfortunately, unfortunately we won't get to. So, the usurer hangs the cousiner. The moneylender, that's the usurer, who can buy out justice, hangs the con man. Because the con man can't buy out justice. If the con man gets caught, but the usurer, the guy who lends money to gain interest on the money, okay, has got plenty of banking left. Which, by the way, that's you know one of the main elements in the problem comedy, The Merchant of Venice. You've got a shot. You've got a, a usurer, a money lender who's a Jew named Shylock, okay. And in the Middle Ages, and even in Shakespeare's day, the biggest money lenders, today we would call them bankers, were Jews. Why? Because they weren't susceptible to the civil laws. Some of the civil laws, at least. Especially the ones dealing with usury 
it was against the law for a Christian to loan money on interest. Middle Ages and in Shakespeare's day. And might have, take that back, that might have been legal by Shakespeare's day. It didn't apply to Jews, which is why Jews were often very, very wealthy, okay, because they did a lot of money lending. So, the usurer hangs the cousiner. Through tattered clothes, small vices do appear. Robes and furred gowns hide all. What? Tattered robes or clothes, small vices appear. Robes and furred gowns hide all. What are the robes and furred gowns? Well, those are the clothing worn by two levels at least, the, the elite of society and those who hold high office. For example, um, sergeants at law, lawyers. Not all lawyers were sergeants at law. Sergeants at law were a higher rank lawyer. Um, they were allowed to wear these specific gowns, specific kind of clothing. Nobody else could wear those. Okay? Similarly, people who held important office, you would know them by the clothes they wore. That is, the very clothes they had indicated that office. Notice our government's nothing like that, right? President wears whatever the president wants. Ca cabinet members wear whatever they want. I mean, there's kind of an unwritten code. You go in the Oval Office, depending upon the president, it was the unwritten code for all presidents but one. You go in the Oval Office, you wear a suit and tie. Period. Everybody does. Okay. Um, only one president kind of loosened slash violated that uh, procedure. So he goes on. Robes and fur gowns hide all. Hide all what? Vices. How, how do they hide the vices? What speaks? Money. Money speaks. You need a you need real world examples. Anybody spell last name like this? Timothy Geithner. Anybody know who that is? He was Obama's first Secretary of the Treasury. I'm not doing this because he's Obama. It has nothing to do with Obama. Timothy Geithner was. Obama's first Secretary of the Treasury is a former Federal Reserve Governor, I think for New York, um, quasi-academic. I think he might have held a couple of academic positions. Well, Obama nominated him to be Secretary of the Treasury. First one, 2008, Obama's first one. And during the Senate confirmation hearings, it became known that Geithner owed something like $5 million, $7 million in back taxes. And yet he was approved. What would happen if, well, I don't know, Bjorn Ord owed $5 million in back taxes? He wouldn't be sitting here. So why could Geithner? Because uh, he's a member of the class for which it doesn't matter. Okay, um, Al Sharpton, who, who, you know, had, I don't remember what it is, it's something like 50 visits to the Oval Office during Obama's eight years in office. He owes like 15 million. Still, still. IRS hasn't gone after him. I know a person, a relative of my wife, who lost her house because the IRS said she was back on her taxes. I mean, literally lost everything. I think she eventually got the money back because it was an IRS error. But, I mean, they took the house, car, whole kit and caboodle. Why? She wasn't one of those with the robe and furred gown. Plate sin with gold. Plate. Covered up, right? Covered up with gold. And the strong lance of justice hurtless breaks. Cover yourself with finery, with gold. I don't know about you, and I don't really care, but Nicole Simpson is dead today because OJ killed her. So how did OJ get off? Well, one, he was OJ Simpson, and two, very, very deep pockets. He 
plated sin. He bought the best lawyers, he, money, literally, that money could buy. Okay? Arm it in rags. A pygmy straw does pierce it. What's the pygmy's straw? That little, no name, nobody gives a rat you know what for a prosecutor who has a fly-by-night case who, who wouldn't be able to prove that two plus two equals four. If the person is poor, what's going to happen? Going to jail. Or, as happens all too often, plead. No jail time, plead guilty. None does offend, none, I say, none. I'll enable them. That is, I'll enable them. Take that of me, my friend, who have the power to seal the accuser's lips. Get the glass eyes. Why glass eyes? Because they don't see. And like a scurvy politician, seem to see the things thou dost not. Now, I don't know about you, that could be dangerous language. Okay, this play is 1601, 02. Queen Elizabeth's still alive. She, she's not very much alive. I mean, she's, she's going to be dead fairly soon. But scurvy politician. Okay, usually politician doesn't apply to the, the monarchy. But if you were a monarch of a particular bit, you could say, he's talking about me. Okay. See, and like a scurvy politician, seem to see the things thou dost not. Appear to see what you don't really see. Is he crazy? Edgar. Oh, matter and impertinency mixed. Matter. He means substance. There is meat in what Lear is saying. Edgar is saying, Sing it, you know, sister. Preach it, brother. This is totally on. But there's also impertinency. It, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't apply. Reason in madness. Same kind of thing we heard both Claudius and Polonius say about Hamlet's madness in a couple of Hamlet speeches. Lear. If thou wilt weep my fortunes, take my eyes. If you're going to weep about the fortune I get in life, then you need to do what? You need to take my eyes. That is, you need to see it how I see it. You need to experience it how I experience it. What's he saying? What's he asking you for? A little bit of empathy. You can't stand over there and say, oh, poor Lear, he's got it so bad. You've really got to he's implying. You've really got to put your feet in my shoes. I know thee well enough. Thy name is Gloucester. See, Lear can see still. <laughs> Physically, at least. Thou must be patient. We came crying hither. Right? You're born. And if you don't start crying immediately, what's the nurse do? So, life begins with what? Pain. One of my favorite lines from one of my favorite films. Life is pain, Highness. Okay, Princess Bride. We came crying hither. Thou knowest the first time that we smell the air, we wall and cry. I will preach to thee. Mark. That is, take note. Look at this. What's Lear saying about life? First thing we do when we are born is like, no, and we go back. Now, bear in mind, Lear is mad. He's not just a little bit mad. He's totally off his rocker mad. Does that mean a mad person can't every now and then have moments of lucidity? It, to me, it's just more and more emphasizes Lear's got Alzheimer's, okay? Gloucester, a lack, a lack, a day. Alack, alack, what day? 
think Ophelia. Alas, to see what I have seen, see what I see. She sees Hamlet, and she thinks in the to be or not to be speech, and what follows after that. The Hamlet is what? Three shake to the wind. He is gone. He is totally mad. That's what Hamlet wants her to think, because he wants her to go to the nunnery. Instead, she, she goes mad, right? Alack, alack the day. This is Gloucester saying, oh, I've lived too long. I should never see a king in this state. Gloucester, when we are born, we cry that we are come to this great stage of fools. Which takes us back to As You Like It. And Jaquie's speech. All the world's a stage, and every man a player, and he has seven acts. Right? Notice these ideas, they just get recycled through Shakespeare's play. If, if, in an ideal course, four courses, six courses, you'd read every one of Shakespeare's plays and all the sonnets and all the poems. Because what you would see is from the earliest play to the last play, Shakespeare really only has about a half dozen or so key themes that he just keeps dealing with. One of those is time as the great equalizer. Why? Time sleeps with all. Everything dies. Okay? Seeing um, reality versus you know, appearance. It's another huge theme. Seeing and yet not seeing. Seeing and being blind is another huge theme that just kind of goes again and again and again. This idea of life being a stage. He just repeatedly goes through that. Right? So he keeps talking. Gentlemen and attendants come in. And the gentleman says, skipping a few lines, round 204, as Lear runs off, you know, challenging his attendants to kind of follow him. The gentleman says, A sight most pitiful, most pitiful in the meanest wretch past speaking of in a king. Most pitiful in the mean, in the lowest person of society. This would do what? This would evoke pity. But in a king? I don't know how to deal with this. Thou hast won a daughter who redeems nature from the general curse which twain have brought her to. And you've got a gloss down there. The one daughter, obviously, talking about Cordelia, which redeems nature from the general curse. That's the curse of Adam and Eve. It could also be alluding to this kind of general curse that men put on women. Is the source of all woe, you know, a common what's called folk etymology of the word woman, and that it's from woe to man. It's utterly idiotic. It has no basis in fact at all. Okay, but it fits this anti-feminist idea that you know men's lives would be fine if it weren't for women. Of course, there wouldn't be any because there'd be no you know procreation to go on. I haven't figured you know that one out yet. So, thou hast one daughter who redeems nature from the general curse which twain, that's Adam and Eve, have brought her to. Okay? So, skipping a little bit more, the gentleman leaves and there's Gloucester speaking with Edgar. Notice Gloucester still doesn't know who Edgar is. Edgar hasn't gone, damn, it's me. You ever gentle gods. Hmm. Hold on a second. <laughs> it wasn't very long ago that Gloucester says, as flies to wanton boys, it's that four scene one, line 36 and following, as flies to wanton boys, we to the gods, they kill us for their sport. Now, you ever gentle gods. Well, remember, Edgar's gotten him to think, gotten him to believe. The gods, when you fell off that mountain, 
The gods kind of gently set you down. The gods must favor you. Take my breath from me. Well, earlier he prayed. Oh, you mighty gods, it's like 4, scene 6, verse 34 or so. Oh, you mighty gods, this world I do renounce, and in your sight shake patiently my great affliction off. If I could bear it longer and not fall to quarrel with your great opposeless wills, my stuff and loathed part, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now, let not my worser, take my breath from me, let not my worser spirit tempt me again to die before you please. What's, what's the my worser spirit? Suicidal, Suicidal thoughts. Like sinful, sinful self. He's playing on the Christian notion that one has a guardian angel and there's also a tempting demon. The Christian notion doesn't have the tempting demon. That's a popular mythology, popular kind of um, folk thing. Bugs Bunny. All, just about every Bugs Bunny cartoon there is at one point or another, you see the guy with the halo and the guy with the pitchfork. And they're always halo on the right, pitchfork on the left. Why? Latin, left, sinistra, sinister. Okay? So he's saying, let not my worser spirit tempt me to what? To die before you to kill myself. Why is he saying, take my breath from me? Because he's tempted now. Why? He sees Lear to see what I have seen. He, he remembers Lear when Lear was in his right mind. And now he sees Lear bat you know what crazy. Edgar, well pray you, Father. Father here doesn't mean daddy. It means old man. He's ascribing honor to him. So, who are you? A most poor man. Made tame to fortune's blows. Made tame. Okay, your gloss tells you, uh, 224, submissive. I don't think it's only submissive. I think it's trained to fortune's blows. Edgar's learned what? It's better to do what when fortune hits? Aesop essentially told a tale about this, a fable about this. The fable of the mighty oak. In the reed, right? What happens when the wind blows? The reed does what? It bends in the wind. The mighty oak, it dies. The moral of the fable? When slings and arrows, when the punches of life happen, rock and go back. <laughs> or take the punch and go back. He says, I've been made tame to these blows. Who? Uh, the art of known, the artifice, the technique, the skill of known and feeling sorrows. Your gloss tells you that means personally experienced and heartfelt sorrows. And pregnant to good pity. Because I have experienced and have internalized those sorrows. What does he mean? I am pregnant to good pity. Capable of evil. When I see someone who what is going through those sorrows, I go up and put an arm around them. I go up and help. But again, why? Because I can put myself in their shoes, which is what Leah was talking about earlier. Notice Shakespeare putting this same kind of idea in a whole bunch of different characters' minds. For what purpose? Open your eyes, audience. Learn. According to Aristotle, that was the purpose of tragedy. To teach the audience, okay, that there but for the grace of God go I. It was to bring out pity in fear. Fear, that could be me. If I make those kinds of decisions, pity to pity those who haven't learned the lessons that these characters 
are demonstrating for us. Give me your hand. I'll lead you to some biting. Come on. Let me take you in. And notice that image. He's going to lead his father. His father doesn't know it's him. Right? Next page. Oswald comes in. He has a message for Gloucester, and he and you know Edgar get in a fight. Edgar kills him. Okay. And he reads the message. Okay. And Gloucester says, after Edgar takes the body off and buries it, Gloucester gets a little soliloquy. Line 283, the king is mad. How stiff is my vile sense that I stand up and have ingenious feeling. Let me see what your gloss says. Okay. Ingenious, conscious. Gloucester laments that he remains sane and hence fully conscious of his troubles, unlike Lear. That is, he thinks, Lear's got it better than I do. At least he's unaware. You know? well, let's go back to the Alzheimer's thing again. You've known somebody or know somebody with Alzheimer's. Usually, especially as the Alzheimer's gets more advanced, you're happier when they're not lucid. Why? Because when they're lucid, they can be aware that they have Alzheimer's. And what they often tend to do is apologize an awful lot for things they don't remember or for saying something repeatedly again and again. So you kind of like, you know, you, you just, that's why you know, in dealing with someone with Alzheimer's, you don't correct them. If they say something that you don't, no, no, no today's not Tuesday, today's Thursday. No, I'm pretty, because they will argue with you till you are blue in the face. Because they don't understand, they're that disconnected, right? So, how stiff is my vile sense that I stand up, that is, I'm aware, and have a genius feeling of, notice what he's saying, of my huge sorrows. Lear isn't aware of his huge sorrows. Gloucester is suggesting. He's not really consciously aware of everything that's happening around him. Better I were distracted. I wish my mind was distracted. I wish I didn't know that my son plotted against me and his elder brother and the elder brother who I disowned actually loved me. So should my thoughts be severed from my griefs and woes by wrong imaginations lose the knowledge of themselves. Woes lose the knowledge of themselves. I haven't thought of doing this, but I'm going to do this. Make this up on a note. That's my note. Shakespeare's Sonnet 30. I probably won't do as much as I want to do today. Shakespeare's Sonnet 30. When to the sessions of sweet, silent thought, I summon up remembrance of things past, I sigh the lack of many a thing I sought, and with old woes new wail my dear time's waste. Then can I drown in I, unused to flow, for precious friends hid in death's dateless night, and weep afresh love's long since cancelled woe, and moan the expense of many a vanished sight. Then can I grieve that grievance is foregone, and heavily from woe to woe tell o'er the sad account of four bemoaned moan, which I knew pay as if not paid before. The speaker is saying in that sonnet, when I sit down, that's the sessions, of sweet silent thought, when I sit down and think about the past, what do I do? I summon up remembrance of things past, that is, things I've forgotten. Things I don't normally think about. Things maybe that I push down and repress. Why? Because I then sigh the lack of many a thing I sought. That is, I sigh now the lack of things that I sought back then. He's kind of saying, I'm thinking about it now, think, what a damn fool I was to look for those things back then. And he goes on about doing what? 
bringing those old buried memories and problems into the present. Well, Gloucester back here is saying, if I could be distract, my woes by wrong imaginations would lose the knowledge of themselves. In Sonnet 30, the speaker is saying, I want to remember the knowledge of those woes. Kind of like if you've ever experienced it. You're not feeling very good. You've had a bad day, bad week, bad month, bad year, and you kind of spiral downwards into a pity party. Well, that's what that speaker's talking about. Gloucester is kind of saying, I wish I could. I wish I could not be aware of what's going on around me. Right? Four seven. Gentleman comes in with Cordelia, Kent, etc. And the gentleman's a healer of some sorts. And he says around line 22, when Lear is carried in a chair by servants, and he's carried in a chair, notice he's not sitting on that, in that chair with his arms on the handrest and he's alert and he's looking at everybody, eagle-eyed, he's asleep. I, madam, in the heaviness of sleep, line 22, we put fresh garments on him. That is, while he was asleep, we changed his clothes. So when Lear went to sleep, how was he dressed? When he fell asleep, in the rags he was wearing out during the storm. Wet, filthy, muddy. Right? That's when he fell asleep. So he was awake wearing all that. When he wakes up, how is he going to be dressed? Clean. What kind of imagery do we have here? Death, burial, resurrection. Baptisms, the way baptisms are often performed. When somebody is baptized, they put on, quote, unquote, especially in the early church. And Shakespeare, they would have done this in Shakespeare's day. person puts on a white garment for the baptism. Or, excuse me, person put, wears clothes that they don't care about because they get baptized, and then those clothes that they are baptized in get burned, get thrown away. And then they get clothed in a white garment. Why? Because the book of Revelation talks about to those who overcome, they will be given a white garment. That's the resurrected, that's the new Adam, that's the clean body, the clean. So we get that same image here. He goes to sleep, a metaphor for death throughout English literature. He goes to sleep filthy and ragged. He wakes up clean. And notice when he wakes up, he's not going to be entirely in his right mind, but he's, he's getting there. So we put fresh garments on him. Be by, good madam, when we do wake him. I do. I doubt not of his temperance. That is, I don't expect him to be fully with us when he wakes up. So why does he want Cordelia to be there? What's the root of her name? What is that? Put it in Latin. She's his heart. That's why he loves her the most. I mean, Shakespeare chose that name intentionally. So, he says, come on, come closer. Play the music a little louder. Now, this isn't, you know, banging, you know, alternative rock. This is calm, gentle music. And Cordelia kneels down and kisses him. Oh, my dear father, restoration hang, restoration be restored. Thy medicine on my lips. What did Shakespeare do there? He inverts the traditional fairy tale, right? The traditional fairy tale, what happens? It's the prince who kisses the maiden. Here, it's the maiden killing, not killing, kissing, not a prince, but her father, the king. 
of thy med restoration hang thy medicine on my lips and let this kiss repair those violent harms that my two sisters have in thy reverence made. Notice what else she's saying. May this kiss restore you. In the Gospels and in Acts, we often see, you know, well, in the Gospels particularly, Christ heals people. Sometimes he heals them um, just by the words of his mouth. Other times he touches them and does things. When he um, tells the, uh, uh, the disciples, receive the Holy Spirit, he kisses them. When God breathes the gift of the Spirit into Adam, he probably kisses him, okay? So there's this element of this kind of thing going on. I, I mentioned C.S. Lewis in my previous class. In C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, when the character of Aslan uh, arrives at the White Witch's castle, Cara Paravel in the first book, and there's all these frozen people, they've been turned into stone, he goes up and he blows on them, okay? It's the same kind of image. So, Cordelia and Kent kind of talk back and forth. And notice, we're told, stage direction, but it's in the form of a speech. Line 43, Cordelia says, he wakes. Speak to him. The gentleman, you speak to him. It's fittest. You're his daughter. Why else is it fittest? You're the one who woke him. It was your kiss, your lips, your restorative powers. How does my royal lord? How fares your majesty? How fares? Today we say, how's it going? Literally, that's what that means. Fares comes from the old English foreign, related to modern German, fairen, F-A-H-R-E-N, and it means, how do you fare? How do you travel? How you doing? How's it going? You do me wrong to take me out of the grave. Here's the burial. So take me out. Resurrection. Thou art a soul in bliss. So if she, according to Lear's still somewhat not clear mind, is a soul in bliss, then where would he be? He would also be a soul in bliss. Lear doesn't think he's a soul in bliss. In fact, later on, not much. We're going to see Cordelia brought in dead, and what is Lear going to be talking about? What is he going to talk about? That his soul, his body, is like on a wheel of fire. So, pardon? The next line. Yeah. Thou art a soul in bliss, but I am bound upon a wheel of fire. What's the wheel of fire? Sir Glossner, line 48. The hellish treatment for the eternally damned. So it is Lear saying, what gives? I'm down here in hell. You're up there in heaven. Could be. But also, if you're Catholic, that wheel of fire doesn't have to be eternal punishment. That could be one of the purgative fires of purgatory. God is called an all-consuming fire. Well, what gets consumed in the presence of God? Sin. What's left? What's not sinful? All right? Huh. That mine own tears do scald like molten lead. His tears, he says, they're burning him. Cordelia, um, you know who I am? You are a spirit, I know. Where did you die? Now, is he looking up at her? How is Cordelia dressed? Personally, if I were directing this, I would not have Cordelia in black. Or any, she'd be in white. So that when he says, thou art, I mean, everybody go, oh yeah, cool symbol. Make it clear. Still, still, far wide. That is far wide of the mark. Lear's not with us yet. He's scarce awake. Let him alone a while. Let, let, him, let him rest. Where have I been? 
where am I? Fair daylight, he kind of looks around, he notices the sun is shining. I am mightily abused. Fair daylight, that implies, okay, so this isn't heaven. I haven't died. Notice reality is kind of shrinking back down to the real, to the here and now. I should even die with pity to see another thus. Another thus. Another person like Cordelia or another this kind of day. I know not what to say. I will not swear these are my hands. Let's see. He does what? He pinches himself. Well, pinching yourself is a pretty good example of what? I'm real. I, I, I really exist. See, there's a whole branch of philosophy and a variety of religions that essentially say none of this is real. This is all make-believe. This is all thought up in some god's head somewhere out there. Or you can go to Wachowski, brothers, sisters, whatever. Now, you know, the Matrix idea and say we're all a program in something else's mind. The proof against all that is find someone who believes that and say, okay, so I'm not real. You're not real. I'm going to, how many stories? I'm not real. Toy's not real. So I pull out of my bag a loaded Glock and go, so this gun isn't real either, right? Yes, it's not real. So if I pull the trigger on this imaginary gun, an, an imaginary bullet will come out, right? And blow your head and everything in it upon everybody behind you, right? So you won't really feel it. See, there was a, a theologian philosopher in the 1960s who was lecturing at Oxford, and he went to the student's room afterwards, and he had an Indian student, and he's kind of Indian, not an American Indian, and the guy was Hindu. Hindus believe this is all an illusion. And this guy, you know, wanted to prove to him, you don't really believe that. You say you believe that, but you don't really in your heart of hearts believe that. And so he went to the hot plate where they were heating up water for tea, and he got the kettle and he went over to the guy's lap and started to do this, and the guy jumped back. Well, if it's not an illusion, you don't worry about boiling water being poured into your groin. It's not real. The groin isn't real. The water isn't real. Pretty much brought him to the back. <laughs> Never thought about it that way. Okay. So, Lear. Would I were assured of my condition. Assured. What's he asking for? Proof. I want to know, Lear is saying. Cordelia, she kneels, look upon me, look upon me, and hold your hands in benediction o'er me. Why does she say, look upon me? Well, someone who's kind of, you know, dealing with mental issues, what's one of the best things you can do, especially if they're in a place that's kind of crowded, it's unknown to them, there's all kinds of sensory stimuli. You do that. You get right in their face so they can't pay attention to all this other. She's saying, focus right here. Right here. But she also tells him to do something. Put your hands in benediction over me. And he's like, no, stop, no. Do not mock me. He? You, you, you're kidding. You're jesting. I am a very foolish, fond old man. Fond, it also means foolish. I'm a foolish, foolish old. He's emphasizing, I am a damn fool. Four score and upward. There, we get the reason why Hopkins says, you can't play Lear until you're 80. He played Lear when he was 48. When he redid Lear last year, he said, now I understand Lear. 80. 
not an hour more nor less, and to deal plainly, that is, to speak perfectly and openly, I fear I'm not in my perfect mind. Something's wrong. I, I know I'm not always here. Me, I know I should know you. I mean, I literally had times when I was out visiting my folks. One time I was working with my dad in the shop. My mom came in, talked with us for a bit, and she asked my dad out, and he came back in, and I knew what that was about. He said, she didn't know who you were, so I explained it. Okay, that's what Lear's talking about. I should know you and know this man. Who's the man? Is it the gentleman or is it Kent? Yet I am doubtful. I'm not sure. I am mainly ignorant. I don't know where I am. And all the skill I have remembers. How, how did I get dressed in white? Because <laughs> most productions I've seen, not all of them, and I don't remember if they do this in the Amazon one, Lear's dressed in white at this point. All right? Some of the productions I've seen. Nor I know where I did lodge last night. Well, where did he lodge last night? In the hovel when he wasn't out in the storm. Don't laugh at me, for as I... And nobody's laughing at him. They don't go, <laughs> you're crazy old Lear. He's begging them not to laugh. For as I am a man, I... Are you Cordelia? Notice, as he speaks, what happens? The fog dissipates. And I think part of that is because Cordelia is still right here in his face. Yes. And so I am. Be your tears wet? That is, are they real? Or am I imagining this? Don't weep. If you have poison for me, I will drink it. Why would she have poison for him? He disowned her. You are no daughter of mine. You have every reason to kill me. I know you do not love me, for your sisters have, as I do remember, done me wrong. You have some cause. That is, you have cause to do me wrong. When he says, I know you do not love me, he's not saying, from back at the beginning of the play, he's saying, I have so treated you that you do not love me now. What's he not thinking of? Empathy. Oh dear, no cause. No cause. Am I in France? Notice what else he's remembered. She married France. Nope. In your own kingdom. Notice what Kent is really saying by that statement. You're still king. What did Gloucester say? You have that about you, which I would kiss. And he says, what's the answer? Authority, it smells of mortality. So the gentleman says, Be comforted, good madam, the great rage you see is killed in him. His madness, it's not totally gone, but it is subsiding. And yet it is danger to make him even o'er the time he has lost. That is, don't ask him about before. Why? Well, with somebody with Alzheimer's, when they have these lucid moments, you don't start asking them questions because that just makes them lose control because they can't remember and everything goes black again. All right? Will it please your highness walk? You must bear with me. Pray you now forget and forgive. Why? I am old and foolish. What if Lear just acknowledged it? Or another way of putting it, what has he just shown that he hasn't shown really anywhere else in the play? And it's something the two daughters allude to earlier on. They say, he hath ever known little of himself. That is Lear's 
know thyself moment. Lear's just gotten in touch with himself. I am old and a fool. That helps explain. Let me now tell you of my darker purpose. His darker purpose is born out of his foolishness. When he divides the kingdom, I would argue, is it Lear dividing the kingdom? Or let's play Hamlet. Or is it Lear's madness? Because a person in his or her right mind doesn't do something like this. Okay. So they leave. They talk, you know, the gentleman can't talk about Cornwall. Act 5, scene 1. So, uh, we see Edmund and Regan come in, and Goneril comes in. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip a bunch of that. Let's go down to, man, I'm going to skip almost most, all of that scene. Go down to, everybody leaves, and we have Edmund left. Okay. So we've had Edmund talking with Goneril and Albany and Regan, etc. And they all, you know, leave at various points. And we're left with Edmund alone on the stage, line 58. So he gets a soliloquy. To both, and this is where we finally hear it directly from the horse's mouth, so to speak. To both these sisters have I sworn my love, each jealous of the other, as the stung are of the adder. Which of them shall I take? Both, one, neither. What's that tell us about Edward? What are the sisters to, to Edmund? What are the sisters to him? Louder? Stepping stones. Stepping stones. They're pawns to be used in this great game. Okay? He doesn't love either of them. Neither can be enjoyed if both remain alive. Ooh, I never thought about that. That is really, really close to what J.K. Rowling says in the prophecy about Harry Potter and Lord Voldemort. Neither can live while the other survives. Hmm. Neither can be enjoyed if both remain alive. To take the widow exasperates, makes mad her sister Goneril. Regan is the widow, her husband Cornwall is dead. Goneril is married to Albany. And hardly shall I carry out my side, her husband, Goneril's husband, Albany, being alive. So, we'll use his countenance for the battle, which being done, let her who would be rid of him devise his speedy taking off. So, if Goneril wants me, she's got to figure out, figure out a way to get rid of her husband. Okay? As for the mercy which he intends, this is Albany, to Lear and her Cordelia the battle done, and they within our power shall never see his pardon, for my state stands on me to defend, not to debate. What has Edmund just told us are his plans for Edmund, for Lear and Cordelia? They both have to die. That should prepare the audience. All right? Um, let's see, Act 5, Scene 2, Edgar and Gloucester are walking and talking. Edgar says, take your rest between this tree, etc., etc., or beneath this tree. Okay. Um... We hear that Lear and Cordelia are taken somewhere around line six. And he says to Gloucester, come on, come on, let's get up, let's go. We don't want you captured. Gloucester, no further, sir. A man may rot even here. No, let me just die here. What? In ill thoughts again. Ill. Thinking of dying, suicide again? No. Men must endure their going hence even as they're coming hither. What's it called when a woman's about to give birth? What do you go in? Labor. For most women, what does that involve? Okay, not the word I wanted, but pain. Men must endure their going hence the same way they came. Laborious, it's work, but it's 
to be involved in that. He's telling his father, you don't get a duck out. Ripeness is all. What's ripeness mean? Keep going. The moment's upon us. Keep going. Ripeness. Think of not quite ripe fruit versus overripe fruit. Not quite ripe. It's sour. It's hard. It's not tasting sweet. Overripe. Blech. What does Hamlet say to Horatio just before the final scene where he goes in to have his dueling match with Laertes? They talk about death. He says, if it's to come, then it won't come later. If it's not to come later, then it's to come now. And then he has a short little speech. Four words. The readiness is Ripeness is all. When it is your time, that'll be your time. Come on. Now is not the time. Okay? So, we see enter in conquest with drum and colors, Edmund, Lear, and Cordelia. That is, Edmund is coming in in victory dress. He's got on like a uniform indicating he's now king to be, so to speak. And there's Lear and Cordelia as prisoners. Okay? Edmund, take them away. Good guard until their greater pleasures first be known that are to censure them. Lear, uh, Cordelia to Lear. We are not the first to, with best meaning, have incurred the worst. For the oppressed king, I am cast down. Myself could else out frown, false fortunes frown. Should, shall we not these daughters... See these daughters and these sisters? Lear, no. No. I don't want to see my daughters. Let's away to prison. We two alone will like birds, will sing like birds in the cage. What's he mean? They'll be in prison, right? But birds do what in their prisons? They still sing. Why? Because they don't know they're imprisoned? No, birds know they're imprisoned because every now and then you'll see one, you know, go and get up to the edge of a cage and try to push it. They can't get out, but they still sing. Who was it? Maya Angelou who wrote, I know why the cage bird sings or something like that? May not, might not have been Maya Angelou. I think it was Maya Angelou. What's the import of that? What's the import of this? Well, it's that no matter where you are, the mind can do what? Satan says in John Milton's Paradise Lost, the mind can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven. How so? How can you turn heaven, the place where all blessedness is, into hell? Well, it depends upon your mindset. Because what else does Satan say in that same passage, I think it's in book three of Paradise Lost, Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. That's how you make a hell of heaven, by not wanting to serve, not acknowledging due worship kind of a thing. Lear is saying, it doesn't matter where we are, as long as we're together, we can pretend none of that out there really matters. When thou dost ask me blessing, I'll kneel down and ask of thee forgiveness. So we'll live and pray and sing and tell old tales and laugh at gilded butterflies and hear poor rogues talk of court news and we'll, walk, we'll talk with them too. Who loses, who wins, that is, he's talking about stuff at court. And notice, to them in their little prison, it won't matter. But we can still talk about it. Who's in, who's out, and take upon us the mystery of things. As if we were God's spies and will wear out in a walled prison packs and sects of great ones that ebb and flow by the moon. He's saying all this other stuff that we take as real and important, 
Let's leave Lear aside for a moment and go to November 21st, 2018, 2019, right? 2019. All the great hullabaloo, for example, in Washington, D.C. Ooh, impeachment. Lear saying, for our lives, what's important? He and his daughter. That's what's important. That relationship, that closeness, etc. Okay? So, they get taken off, and Edmund gives a command to his captain and stuff and such. It says, to be tender-minded, line 32, does not become a sword. If you're a soldier, be a man. Suck it up. Do your job. Kill him when I give the command. Okay? Albany comes in. He and Edmund and Regan and, you know, Goneril, they all kind of fight back and forth. Not phys physically, verbally. Line 84. Albany. Stay yet. Hear reason. Well, not many people within the play are hearing reason. And he's also implying what Edmund is doing, what Edmund is plotting, is against reason. It's foolishness. Why? Because it goes against the ordained order of things. That whole great chain of being idea. Edmund, I arrest thee on capital treason, and in thy attaint, this gilded serpent, pointing to his wife. For your claim for a sister I borrowed in the interest of my wife till she is some contracted to this lord, blah, 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 blah. Okay? Goner was like, ooh, good, this will be fun. A little an interlude, that is, like a little mini play. Thou art armed, Gloucester, let the trumpet sound. He calls him Gloucester. Why? Because he's deposed his father. If none appear to prove upon thy person thy heinous manifest in many treasons, there is my pledge. So Albany says, I will prove what I've just charged you with. How? Single combat. Oh, nice medieval, you know. We're not it's not gonna be a judge and jury and all that nonsense. The gods will determine who is right. Okay? Edmund's like, all right, I'll fight you. Throws his gauntlet down. And then a herald comes in. And the herald says, uh, there's a man here who wants to accept this challenge. That is, there's a man here who wants to fight Edmund. Cool. Lions 130. Actually, let me back up. Lions 124. So the herald asks Edgar, what's your claim? Who are you? No, my name is lost by treason's tooth bear non and canker bit, yet I am noble as adversary. Who is that adversary? It's Edmund. Okay. And Edgar says, draw your sword, that if my speech offend a noble heart, this arm, thy arm may do thee justice. Here's mine. So he draws his sword. And he explains a bunch of stuff, which I'm going to, skip because we don't have much time but he calls them all kinds of names and Edmund's like you know I shouldn't fight you until I know who you are why because he might not be someone of equal rank he says but you look noble your outside look so fair and warlike and that tongue some say of breeding breathes that is you speak properly you have the right accent and those insults you just said indicate, you know, breeding and education. Okay. So they fight. Edmund falls. And Edmund says, line 165, what you have charged me with, that have I done. Oh, and a lot more. The time will bring it out. Tis past and so am I, but what art thou? Who are you? And Edgar shows himself. Notice what Edgar says. Let's exchange charity. What's charity? Here's five bucks. No. Love. Let's exchange love. By that he means forgiveness. I will forgive you for what you have done. You forgive me for what I have done. Killing you. I am no less in blood than thou art, Edmund. I am more, the more thou hast wronged me. My name is Edgar, thy father's son. 
the gods are just, and our pleasant vices make instruments to plague us. That is, the gods use our vices, use that language that Her Aristotle used, they use our homertias, our fatal flaws, for what? To plague us. Well, what's the purpose, so to speak, of a plague? I don't mean a general plague, but an illness. It's designed to turn the person inward to cause them to really see and know thyself. John Donne says it's to take affliction and turn it into gold, to make it valuable, to learn something from it. The dark and vicious place where thee he got, Gloucester, the dark and vicious place, the whore's bed, did what? Cost him his sight. Thou hast spoken right, tis true, the wheel is come full circle. He started here out as an illegitimate bastard. He rose to the top, and now he's back down here, because he's dead very shortly. So, They embrace, uh, excuse me, um, Albany speaks, I'm going to skip a bunch. Edgar um, gives a long speech, talks about his father and such, um, and says his father, Gloucester, is dead, line 200 and following, his flawed heart, a lack too weak to conflict to support, <coughs> twist to extremes of passion, joy, and grief, burst smilingly. Edmund says, that's moved me. Oh, there's something else you need to know about. Okay. And Edmund tells them about Lear and Cordelia, what's going to happen. They send soldiers, too late. Line 262 following. Because Edmund says, the captain has commission to hang Cordelia and to blame the, to put the blame on her. Lear comes in carrying Cordelia. How, 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 you men of stone, hide your tongues and eyes. Kent, is this the promised end? What's it mean, the promised end? Judgment day. Is this the last day? Is this the beginning of the apocalypse? It can't get any worse. Edgar, or image of that horror. Think about it. If it's an image of that horror, every image is what? It's imperfect. Look, just look at your driver's license photo. That's not you. Look at a photo of a loved one. That's not the person, right? It's an image. So if it's an image of that horror, then you don't want to be around them. Okay? So they go to Lear. Lear, you know, calls a murderer's plague, you know, calls for a plague upon them all. And then he addresses Kent. Are you not Kent? He says, yes. Where's your servant keys? Uh, Lear, he's a good fellow, blah, blah, blah. And what does Lear think for a moment is going on with Cordelia? He said, look, she breathes. He's like, no, she, she's dead. She's all the way dead. Lear, 311. And my poor fool is hanged. Now, a lot of glosses say, and I think pretty sure this one does, Cordelia. My poor fool, Cordelia. Cordelia's in his arms, or was briefly. So is he referring to Cordelia? Because your, your gloss tells you poor fool can be in a, a term of endearment. Could be. I think it could also be he's saying the fool is hanged. Don't know for sure. Probably is Cordelia. No, no, no life. Why should a dog, a horse, a rat have life? And thou no breath at all. And he dies. He dies saying, do you see? Look on her. Look, her lips. Look, look there. Look there. Like, he almost thinks he sees her breathe. Oh, and he dies. Edgar, look up. Edgar sees something, or he implies that he sees something. Kent, 
vex not his ghost. Renaissance medieval belief, when somebody dies, their ghost goes out through the mouth. And Edgar's going, I see it. Can't leave it alone. Don't trouble it. Don't stop it. Let it go. Let him pass. He hates him that would upon the rack of this tough world stretch him out longer. The rack? What image did Lear use when he said when he wakes up and says, I think you are a spirit bless, but I am stretched out on a flaming wheel of fire. It's Kent saying the world is the rack. Yeah, kind of. Is is Shakespeare? We had Hamlet use very similar language. Well, if you think it is, Hamlet says, then it is. He's gone indeed. The wonder is he hath endured so long, he but usurped his life. That is, he lived longer than he should have. Albany, take him out. And he says to Cordelia, excuse me, he says to Kent and Edgar, you guys should rule I can't, because I was involved in the plot. Kent, I have a journey, sir, shortly to go. My master calls me. I must not say no. What's he mean? I'm dying soon. Who's my master that calls me? Lear. One of the greatest interpreters of Shakespeare in the last 150 years, Laurence Olivier. That's his epitaph. That's what he put. On his tombstone. Okay. Edgar, the weight of this said time we must obey. That is, endure. Speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. Notice the, the juxtaposition. Speak what we feel, what's in here, not what we ought to say, not what we're told to say. The oldest hath borne most. That's Lear. We that are young shall never see so much nor live so long. We will never see what Lear has seen. We will never live as long. He doesn't mean 80 years. He means Lear, man, he suffered like multiple lifetimes in his 80 years. Okay? And, and notice the play just ends with a death march. Bum, bum, ba -dum, bum, ba -dum, ba -dum. Why? Compare this play's ending with Hamlet's. Hamlet ends how? Hamlet's borne out on a stretcher by captains, full honor guard. Okay. But the world goes on, right? Fortinbra is the new king of Denmark and such. This is kind of apocalyptic. I mean, it's... It, Kind of sounds like the end, the end. Even though we're told Edgar's going to go on. This play is much, much, much more bleaker than does Hamlet. Okay, we have 10 minutes. Um, 10 minutes to start the Tempest. <laughs> yeah, we can. Well. Louder? Give us an overview of Yeah, real quickly. Play begins. Tempest is probably Shakespeare's last singly authored play. Right? That is the last one he wrote by himself. 1611-1612 is its common date. And the fact that it was his last singly authored play really, really works well for interpreting it because of the line that Prospero gives us towards the end of the play about breaking his staff, you know, I'm done. The way a lot of earlier critics read that is that Shakespeare going, writer's block. I've, I've written everything I have to say, which, you know, you have to admit, in the 20 years or so he was writing, it's pretty good output, 37 plays, singly authored, all by himself, five act plays at that. 154 sonnets and four really long poems. Really long poems meaning 500 plus lines. Okay, 
I mean, the guy never stopped writing. So we have the Tempest. What's a Tempest? It's a storm. Right? Tempests are one of those images that Shakespeare loves to use. He uses them throughout an awful lot of plays. He also uses them in sonnets. Look at, um, for example, Sonnet 116, which is the love, the love sonnet. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments, for love is not love when an alteration finds, etc., etc. Okay? So the play opens with, notice, a tempestuous noise of thunder and lightning. Okay, so who are our main characters? We've got Alonzo, king of Naples, Sebastian, his brother, Prospero, the right duke of Milan, Antonio, his brother, the usurping duke of Milan. But we're not going to see um, a lot of these characters until a little bit later on. I mean, the act one, scene one, we are going to see them, but they, they're they left very quickly. Because act one, scene one, it's a shipwreck. And we leave them alone for a bit. I want to pick up with Act 1, Scene 2. We start with Miranda. Notice the root of her name. Mir. It's not Mir like the Russian Mir. It's Mir as in admire or admiration. What's it mean to admire somebody or to be full of admiration? Well, it's a little bit more than to look up to. It's a little bit more than to like. It's to be in wonderment. Okay? So she has this name. And she talks to her father. And her father enters in his magic cloak, Prospero. And she tells him, If by your art you raise this storm, put it down. Stop the storm. Why? I saw a vessel on the sea, and I saw the vessel destroyed. And I'm thinking of all those poor souls, lines 9 and 10. Poor souls, they perished. Had I been any god of power, I would have sunk the sea within the earth, or it should be good ship. She's upbraiding her father. How dare you for causing this to happen? He says, be collected. Calm down. No more amazement. Tell your piteous heart, no what do you mean no harm? No harm. I have done nothing but in care of thee. Of thee, my dear one. My daughter who art ignorant of what thou art. That's well, not a nice thing to say, to tell her daughter. Tell your daughter she's ignorant of what she is. She is ignorant of what she is. What's he mean of what thou art? You're the rightful daughter of the Duke of Milan. She doesn't know. She thinks she just lives here on this deserted island. Who are ignorant of what thou art, not knowing of whence I am. That is, I'm the Duke of Milan. Nor that I am more better than Prospero, Master uh, more to know did never meddle with me. I, I, I never thought to ask. Right? If you're born, seemingly, and raised in a single place, and that's all you know, why do you ask questions about it? Nothing's ever prompted her. So he says, sit down. Tis time I should inform thee farther. Here, take off my magic garment. Well, why is it time? Well, because this ship just wrecked. <laughs> and there's now people on the island. And... Okay, so he puts the cloak and the staff down. Lie there my art, my art, my skill, my artifice. He says, Wipe your eyes. Don't. Everybody on that ship, they're all alive. They're all fine. Don't worry. The direful spectacle of the wreck, which touched the very virtue of compassion in thee, I have with such provision in mine art so safely ordered that there is no soul, no, not so much as perdition as an air, as an hair. Why the loss of a hair? Because Christ says the numbers of hairs on your head are numbered. It's linking the two. Nope, everybody's fine. For now, you must know more. She says, okay, you've, you've told me some before, but you, not yet, soon. He says, now's the time. Okay, so he says, tell me, what's your earliest memory? 
can you think from when I was three years old? She goes, yeah. What? House? Person? What do you, what do you, um, didn't I have four or five serving women? She says, yes, you did, and more. But how is it that this lives in my mind? How do, you, how do you remember this? What else do you see? Do you remember coming here? Nope. Well, it happened 12 years ago, Miranda. So she 15? Pretty close. 12 years since, thy father was the Duke of Milan and a prince of power. Um, aren't, aren't you my father? Because he said, your father. He didn't say I. Uh, thy mother was a piece of virtue, and she said thou was my daughter. And thy father was Duke of Milan, his only heir, and princess no worse. Notice he puns. Well, your mother said I was your father, but, you know, the women. Okay? So, she says, what, what foul play occurred? Why are we here and not in Milan? Now, she doesn't know Milan from Rome. She's never been in a city. She's only lived on this deserted island. So he tells her, my brother, thy uncle, called Antonio, mark me, that is, pay attention, that a brother should be so perfidious, he whom next thyself of all the world I love, and to him put the manage of my state, that is, next to you I loved him most in the world. Why? Her mother is dead. So he says, I put him in charge of the estate. Why did he do that? Well, he's a scholar and a magician. So that he could do what, he says. So that I, being so reputed in dignity for the liberal arts without a parallel, those being all my study, the government I cast upon my brother. I gave him the duty of ruling the dukedom so I could study magic. In other words... He does almost exactly the same what Lear does, only he doesn't formally do it. He doesn't sign a proclamation. I hereby give all the rights, duties, responsibilities of Duke to my brother. Okay. You follow me? Dost thou attend? She goes, yep, yep. So he says, so he did what? I neglected all my worldly ends, dedicated to closeness, the bettering of my mind, blah, 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 blah. And he usurped my position. And he took me and he took you and he put us in a boat. And if it weren't for the old man, Gonzalo, who helped supply the boat with some few necessaries, we would have died in the ocean. Okay? Miranda. Oh, the heavy, the heavens. Right. So he goes on. I'm going to skip a bit. She asks, 138, Wherefore did they not that hour destroy us? He says, I'll tell you. <clears throat> so they heard us aboard a bark. They put us in. That's where he mentions Gonzalo, a noble Neapolitan, 163 or so. He gave us rich garments, linen, stuffs, and necessaries. And she says, oh, I wish I could see that, man. She wants to thank him. He says, so would I. And now he puts his cloak back on. Why? Magic to do. Sit still and hear the last of our sea sorrow. Hearing this island we arrived, and here have I, thy schoolmaster, made thee more profit than other princes can. That is, I've taught you more and better than other nobles can. And she says, thank you for it. But, but why the storm? By accident, most strange, bountiful fortune, now my dear lady. Now that's kind of interesting. The now my dear lady can apply to Miranda. Or he can say bountiful fortune is his dear lady. That he kind of commands fortune. But anyways, fortune made it so that he saw the zenith upon a star. He knew there was a ship coming. Okay. And he says, but now it's time for you to go to sleep. He doesn't fill out the rest. And she falls asleep because he puts a spell on her. And he calls Ariel. And Ariel is a spirit being. The island is full of them. He doesn't create them. Okay? The island has them naturally. 
and we will stop there. So for Tuesday, um, this play is really short. Uh, it's only 30 pages. Get through Act 3. Do the revised paper if you're going to. And I am planning on bringing the final exam topics, questions, or we'll post them on D2L that day to give you a little additional time. And if you want to turn it early, you want to do that also. Big, oh yeah, good. Big papers due on Tuesday, and I'm going to post an announcement, a, a, a slight modification of the requirements, an easing, okay. slightly. Okay. Of the requirements. I was like, I have yeah. a lot done no, it's going to be a 15 to 20 page paper with 30 sources.